Who did Jesus die for? Did he die for just the elect or for the whole world? Well, the answer is yes. One of the theologically debated topics that we come across is who did Jesus die for? This issue of limited atonement or unlimited atonement, particular redemption, however you want to phrase it. The question is, did Jesus die for the entire world or did he simply die for those that are going to be saved, that are going to place their faith in him? In other words, did he die for just the elect only? You have those who are Calvinistic, who believe that, believe in limited atonement, that he only came just to die for those. And there's others who stand outside of that, who may agree with other parts of Calvinism or other parts of Tulip, who deny this issue of limited atonement. Well, let's go to the scriptures. We're going to look at a couple things. One, we're going to look at some scriptures, obviously, but we're going to look at some Old Testament scriptures as well to see where all of this comes from. And then we're going to also bring in a an actual, a noted, known, well-known Greek scholar to, to get his opinion on a particular text. So let's start off with a passage that is brought up, and this is in John 10. Jesus makes this statement, 14 and 15. He says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, indicating that his sheep, the only sheep that matters, are those that are his. And so he knows them, they know him. And he says, even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And so here we see, it seems to be that he's laying his life down for just the sheep. The question is, is he laying his life down just for the sheep only? Obviously, and I don't think anyone has a problem with this statement, that it only affects or it's only beneficial for those that believe. The question is, did he also do so for those who did not believe, who could believe? And therein lies another issue. We won't go too far into it, but I am one that believes that anyone could believe, they just won't keep believing, uh, and it takes something special on the part of God that is their hearts being regenerated. A absent that, you're not going to keep believing. But a discussion for another date. Let's go look at some other passages that ought to be brought up. Let's go to John 3.16. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Well, what does that passage have to do with anything? Well, notice how the Greek comes in, and this is kind of, this kind of helps, I think, to shape the argument a little bit better. So this word that's used here for God so loved the world is hutos gar. This gar is what's called a post-positive, where we get the word for. So hutoso is where I want you to notice. In this way, or this is how, this is how God shows his love for the world. And so this is how he does so. But in that, though, his son uh, comes in order that those that are believing, there seems to be a little bit of distinction between the totality of the world and those that are believing. Because he says he sent his son, he gave his only son in order that those who are believing, in order that the believing ones will not perish. So there seems to be, or one could make the the, the, the case that there seems to be a distinction between one sending his son, him showing his love for the entirety of the world, but him coming is only going to benefit those that are believing in him. You can make a case for that in this in this uh, verse. And so let's see if you can do the same thing other places. In Hebrews 2, 9, this part, I think it I think helps to start bolstering the point or the case that he did die for the whole world not just those who are ultimately going to be the ones that are going to believe in him. Why do we say so? Because in Hebrews 2, 9, he says, but we do, do see him who was made for a little lower while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God, he, may, he might taste death for everyone. The question is that he might taste death for everyone. Is that the state that he's only tasting death for just only the believers, for every one of the believers, for all of the believers. It's a little harder to determine. And so in this case, I guess your doctrine, your the your theological per persuasion or bent or leaning would tell you who, who the everyone is. I want to go to this passage here. And this is where I this is where I believe these next few passages, I believe, make the point that Christ came to die for the entire world, though it's only effective for those that are believing. In 1 Timothy 4.10, 1 
For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God. Here it is. Who is the Savior of all men, especially of the believers. Now, there is a distinction. All men and then the believers. There is a clear distinction here. As a matter of fact, we have a word that marks a distinction, malista, or from the Greek word malone, uh, especially or rather. So he is a savior for who? For all men. Panto anthropon, so all of the men. So if we were to say just the men who are saved, just those who are believing, just the actual true trusting followers of Christ, well, then why would you say, especially of those who are believing? It doesn't really make, a, it doesn't follow, it doesn't make a lot of sense to say he died for those who are believing, especially for those who are believing. So in this case, I think, I think he's making the point that he died. He came to pay the cost that's needed for everyone, but especially for those that are believing. I think that's where you can make the point that his, his payment was made, but only those that accept it will it be beneficial for them. There's this word that's used there, this term that's used uh, in the Greek, this word propitiation. It's a payment. Now, we're going to see that in 1 John uh, 2, 2. And in doing so, we're going to have to go back and look where this word comes from. In 1 John 2, 2, you're going to see this is a clear distinction between the world and the believers. He says and he himself is the propitiation of our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the world. That seems to be a clear distinction. Notice he says for ours, um, I mean, propitiation for our sins. Well, whose sins are we speaking of? He is making a payment for our sins. Now, if our sins ref refers to just the believers, well, then why make this next statement? And not for ours, the believers only, but also for those of the whole world. So some might say, well, wait a second. He, he Is he indicating us believers here, but then also us believers outward in other places. That doesn't go with this. Now, I want to go ahead and bring in, before we go back to this passage, I want to go ahead and bring in something that William Mounts has said. William Mounts is well known, obviously, as a Greek scholar. As a matter of fact, there are very many, there are many textbooks uh, that he has authored to teach people Greek. So does he know Greek? Sure. He's, in, he's on translation committees to translate various Bibles from Greek to English. He is a renowned teacher of Greek and a scholar. So let's listen to what he says about this particular passage. Concerning the sins of us. So concerning our sins. And here's where it gets kind of strange. Not concerning the of ours only, but. So this is a very late placement for a post positive. I don't know if there are any post positives more than five words into the phrase so it's but not for ours only and hematerial means our in all its different cases but also for all and halos is like pos it's in the predicate position when it's functioning as an attributive concerning the whole world and this engenders some interesting discussions on limited atonement, but I would encourage you to say, well, what does the text say? It's for the whole world. And so that's got to be what it means. So William Mounts has the same belief that I have, that is he's making a distinction between our sins, that is us as believers, and also for the world, which is why you see this, this separation, why you see this but that's also used there. But this word I also want to look at is this word that's highlighted, this word halasmas. This is the Greek word for propitiation, a payment. It is to appease a debt. Now, the question is, can you appease a debt if no one actually accepts it? Well, yes, you can. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's go to Leviticus and let's start. Let's let's go to first of Leviticus 16. And I want to read a passage. This is the, the, the Day of Atonement, what, what governs it. And he says, so the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement. Now, this word atonement is this Greek word that's used here. I'm looking at the, the Greek Septuagint. This word that's used here is the same Greek word, halasmas. What does that mean? So he's, he's making atonement or he's making appeasement to satisfy 
the Lord's wrath. But now I want to go to Leviticus 17, 11 as well. And we're going to see the same word here for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your soul. The same word appeasement. The question is, how does this work? Remember, all we're doing is we're piggybacking off of this concept that we see in the Old Testament, this atonement, whereby there's a priest who confesses sins on the head of the scapegoat, sends the scapegoat away, and then also the blood is shed by the sacrificial offering to make payment, to make appeasement. Here's the question. When that payment or that appeasement or that propitiation is made, Obviously, and clearly he's making appeasement or payment for all of Israel and those who might want to join in. Is it effective for all of Israel and even those who are not of Israel who also might, to join, might want to join in? Well, no, it's not. But has atonement been made for all of Israel? Yes. But has it been realized or actualized for all of Israel? No. So when I say yes, he died for the world and yes, he died for those that are believing. This is what I'm speaking of. He dies for them. Clearly, it's only going to be effective for those that place their faith in, in what's being happened and then what's happening. So just like we see in the Day of Atonement, we've got these people that are there who are to afflict their souls, humble themselves and to place faith in what was happening in this atoning work. The, the, the sacrificial offering being killed and the blood uh, shed and spread on the altar, the sins placed on the head of the scapegoat. And then you've got a mediator making intercession for those who that are believing in or having faith in the atonement that was given. So sometimes we might use atonement in general to speak of all of it, but truth be told, really, it is really to focus only on the payment that is made. For example, let me give you a story I've shared with you before. A true story where there were some young folks who were at a restaurant who could not pay the bill. The bill was more than what they could pay and they were thinking desperately of what they could do to get away from this restaurant because they don't have the money to pay for this bill. Well, there was a man that was sitting by and he heard this. And so he decides to pull out his check and to write a check to pay the debt. He's speaking to the waitress and he's telling her what he's doing. While this is going on, while payment is being made, one kid gets up and does what he shouldn't do. He runs off. While he's running off, there's an officer there who catches him, catches the, the kid, takes the kid to the manager and finds out what's going on. And so he takes him and locks him up. While this is happening, unbeknownst to the manager, unbeknownst to the police officer, unbeknownst to the kid that runs off, this person's to the side making a payment for them. Now, he's paying for all of their debt. However, when this young man is, is brought before the judge, the judge rules that even though this man paid the debt, he still owes a debt. Why? Because he did not take the payment that the man made. Similarly, we have the same thing that's happening here. Payment is made for everyone, but ultimately payment is made only for the people that trust in it, that believe in it. So yes, Jesus did come and die for the whole world, just like we see in the Old Testament offering system, the Old Testament Day of Atonement, the same as now, he, can't, he came to die. And as John says, he came to be a payment or make a payment or be a propitiation for our sins, but not just ours only, but for the whole world. Payment is literally made for everybody, whoever wants to believe and they don't. All of the heavy lifting was done. And then you still don't accept the payment that was made for you. Well, then guess what? It is as though no payment was made, even though payment was made. Amen.